Welcome back. We'll now move on to the second session of the day, focusing in on geology. The aim of this session is to highlight how Geoscience Australia data sets, new and revisited legacy data sets, are being used to grow a common understanding of Australia's geology through time and space to support decision making with respect to mineral energy and groundwater resources. Our first speaker in this session is Dr. Mariord Bonado, Director of Integrated Geological Mapping. Mariord leads a team who focuses in on mapping subsurface geology in 3D and using novel methods. She holds a Master's of Science in Earth Sciences from the University of Chambray in France and a PhD in Geodynamics from the University of Nice in France. Prior to joining Geoscience Australia in 2019, she gained nearly a decade of experience in consulting in the resource sector after a brief time in academia. Her interest is in the analysis and integration of multidisciplinary geoscience data sets for mapping and visualising subsurface geology in space and time. It's my great pleasure today to present you our progress on mapping the Australia's geology on behalf of a very, very large team across the program. I would like also to thank our partners from academia and government. So in the previous session, you heard a lot about uh, the huge amount of pre-competitive data we are acquiring through the program. And today I'm here to talk about how we extract geology from it. So this work is about developing a new knowledge of the subsurface and land cover which is crucial to understand the Earth systems. Essentially, this work will provide the ability to assess the resource potential on any part of Australia. And I would like to draw your attention today on this example that was developed as part of the first part of, of the program, which applies on mineral systems. This map is derived from seismic tomography and shows the thickness of the Australian plate. Thick is in blue and thin is in red. And what you can see on this map is that known sedimentary hosted base metal deposits, including some of the largest, they all sit on the edge of a thick lithosphere. So from this correlation, we can infer that suitable rocks for similar deposits could also be found elsewhere along this edge. And this prediction allows to cut the search base down to about 15% of the whole continent. This result was obtained by mapping the geological architecture at great depth. But mineral systems are very complex and to map the signature and improve our predictions, we need to take into account all the geological parameters that control uh, the generation and preservation of mineral systems. And this can be achieved by mapping subsurface at various depths. In this talk, I will focus on crystal scale mapping that allows us to link the first order lithospheric architecture with the surface observations. And a key data set that captures the crystal architecture, for example, is the major crystal boundary data set. These major crystal boundaries delineate crystal domains and are fundamental to understand the tectonic evolution and the basin development. They are also first order structures that facilitate deep and shallow fluid movement within the crust. So focused on the North Australia Craton, a new 3D model will be released by the end of December 22. This revision integrates new deep geophysical datasets, such as deep seismic reflection surveys, magnetotelluric and passive seismic, as well as isotopic data that were not available prior to EFTF. One of the key results is the new Gulunguru fault that underlies the Tinant and East Tinant region that was not been mapped before. This is an ongoing work and the focus will shift progressively on Southern Australia to integrate new pre-competitive data, including, for example, the recent update of the isotopic atlas, where about 1,600 new ages have been compiled in, the, in collaboration with state partners. So during the first phase of the program, we developed a chronostratigraphic approach to map the geology in space and time, focusing on mapping the major geological eras. The model resulted from the integration and standardization of multidisciplinary datasets in order to characterize the composition and architecture of cover. The new depth estimates were consistently stored in the estimates of geological and geophysical surfaces database in order to optimize the reuse of data. And in the next few slides, I will give you an update on the progress we are making in this activity. 
So let's start with the layered solid geology. This work consists of peeling off stratigraphic units layer by layer to reveal and predict the extent and nature of older rocks. More broadly, this work allows to map signature of resource systems. And in the next talk, my colleague uh, Steve Lewis will speak about how the Australia's provinces database, updated from the solid geology, are used to support a national groundwater understanding. The map on the left here shows the current status of the data set. Since 2020, we have progressed the national coverage by mapping in Queensland, Western Australia and Southern Australia. The map covering Southern Australia that I'm showing you now will be released in December 22 and will be refined as part of the Darling Kernamona de la Marianne project as well. This new data set builds on the state geological survey data and provide a consistent, seamless data set across three states. It also provides the first layered solid geology data set in Victoria and Tasmania. All right, so the solid geology underpins the mineral potential mapping, but given the scale of one to one million, some key units may be too small to be well captured and may be misrepresented in the mineral potential assessment. And that is the case for alkaline rocks, for example although these rocks contain some of the world's largest deposits of rare earth. So GA is also undertaking a layered data compilation for alkaline rocks across Australia. The Archean, Mesozoic and Cenozoic datasets will be released in the next couple of months and will consist of a report complemented by a fully attributed GIS with key informations. Working with our partners from the geological survey organizations, the data set will be complemented as well with geochemical and isotopic data to characterize the nature, distribution, and timing of alkaline magmatism. Let's move on to the depth, or the depth attribution of the cover surfaces. Airborne electromagnetic data is a useful, cost-effective, and non-invasive exploration tool to map the geology undercover down to approximately 500 meters. And in the previous session, you would have heard already about the, the status of the national coverage. In the next few slides, I will take you on a journey across Australia to look at our cover mapping activities. But first, what the data tells you. AM data are models that inform the electrical conductivity of the subsurface. This electrical conductivity varies and depends on the rock physical properties. And for example, igneous and metamorphic rocks will, ha will have a low conductivity, whereas mudstones, for example, will have a higher conductivity. And this is only true for dry, unweathered rocks. These electrical conductivities are influenced by weathering, porosity, and the presence of water. So when we map the cover, we take into account all these factors and we map conductivity contrast where that we calibrate and attribute with surface geology and drill holes. Our first stop is the North Australia Creighton. We recently published a revised internally consistent data set building on the first pass interpretation of the OzAEM1 survey that was released in 2022. This updated interpretation led to the revision of the cover model. And this model was produced using interpolation algorithm implemented in the open source 3D geological modeling platform Loop3D. This revised model uh, that, you show, that is shown here with the geology draped on top of the surface will be released in December 22. Our next stop, the Canning Basin. The Canning Basin is known for its thick onshore salt accumulation and our first pass AEM interpretation revealed disruption of the electrical conductivity in the, shallow, in the shallow stratigraphy, likely caused by the movement of salt at great depth. This study demonstrates the potential of AM data as a useful tool for assessing the presence of salt diapirs at depth. Tomorrow, my colleague Andrew Feitz will talk about the importance of mapping salt for hydrogen storage. And we are pleased to release this work today. Let's move now to the southeastern Australia. We are currently undertaking cover mapping in this region and the AEM interpretation is scheduled to be released in the coming months. The depth estimates will be added to the X database. In addition to this work in this region, we are finalizing a targeted magnetic inversion modeling study 
in partnership with CSRO that will add an additional 1100 new depth estimate in eggs by December 22. This new egg dataset, integrated with the solid geology maps, will assist with the development of a new 3D cover model in the coming months and will provide a geometric basis for resource assessment in this region. The last case study I would like to share with you today is located in Musgrave. Here, we are mapping Paleo Valley extent and thickness to target future water supply options. New AM data is currently being acquired to contribute to this work, but in the meantime, we reprocessed, inverted, and interpreted publicly available spectrum data. The figure at the bottom right shows a first pass elevation maps of Paleo Valleys that we will use as a basis for interpreting the regional data. The interpretation results uh, will inform the 3D architecture of the shallow cover and help conceptualize hydrogeological models. So in the different case study I just presented you, the interpretation was done manually, section by section. But given the rapid expansion of the dataset, it is very challenging to keep up with the interpretation. So to increase efficiency, we are examining ways to adapt our approach and make use of the recent advances in high performance computing. And in this example, we apply machine learning to assist with interpreting AM data and generating a 2.5D model for the base of Cenozoic. The model aims to establish predictive relationships between the manual AM interpretation for the base of Cenozoic, defined by conductivity contrast, and a set of input data sets that capture variations in landscape, climate, and geological materials. The preliminary results that you can see here on the cross-section show that the model performs quite well with a maximum difference of 12 meters in elevation between the interpreted and predicted horizon peak. The model depth peaks are then used to produce a predicted Cenozoic depth surface and you can see on the right that we can identify some paleo channels for example. This workflow has the potential to assist with regional scale interpretation and has the benefit to provide a consistent objective approach for interpreting the data. It also integrates additional data sets that wouldn't be used otherwise. This workflow is still in development and various machine learning algorithms and case studies are still being tested to refine this approach. In this other example, we apply machine learning to generate predictive high conductivity maps to interpolate between flight lines. And here, the model aims to establish predictive relationships between AM conductivity measurements and a set of input datasets as described previously. The figure at the top right shows that the machine learning approach provides a much higher resolution compared to other interpolation methods. And if we look at the out-of-sample predicted conductivity result along a flight line, we can see a very good correlation between the measurements shown here in blue and the predicted values here shown in brown, which confirms a very good model performance again. So if you'd like to know more about the technique or the results, we are releasing this work today. Moving now from the near surface to the surface mapping. The barest Earth model has been updated using the Sentinel-2 satellite imagery. This model was produced from a time series analysis of satellite imagery that captured periods of exposed bare soil in order to reduce the masking of vegetation and facilitate a more direct mapping of soil and bedrock. By mapping the variations of surface mineralogy, these datasets give us some indication on the rock lying beneath the soil. The ternary derivative can also enhance soil mineralogy and where the red shows clays, blue indicates silica or carbonate rich bedrocks or quartz sand and the green indicates the presence of iron oxides. From the two figures on the left you can appreciate the level of details that you can get from this imagery. And this work was released in November 21. To conclude, well, a lot is happening, as you can see, and under this project, we released already six products, and there is a lot more to come in the next few months. So please stay in touch with us uh, with, through the EFTF newsletter and the website, and visit the data portal to access the latest data. Thanks very much for joining us today. Thanks. Thank you, Mary Ord. It's wonderful to see how the data sets are being used to grow a national understanding of Australia's geology. Next.
Dr. Hashim Kerry, Project Leader for National Groundwater Systems, will share our journey towards a national understanding of groundwater. Hashim is the Acting Director for the Groundwater Advice and Data Section, which focuses on groundwater technical advice, provision for the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. Hashim has a Bachelor of Science with Honours and a Master's of Science in Geophysics from Adelaide University and a PhD in Environmental Engineering from the University of Queensland. Prior to joining Geoscience Australia in 2012, he has experience from consultancy and other government departments. Over to you, Hash. Hello, I'm Hashim Carey, and I'm a co-leader of the National Groundwater Systems Project with Dr Donna Cathro. I will be providing an overview of our contributions towards a national understanding of groundwater. The outcomes of the National Groundwater Systems Project are striving towards include increasing the availability of nationally seamless hydrogeological data information through the characterisation of our water systems, applying tested and robust workflows and geoscience approaches to further our understanding of these groundwater systems. We also want to start down the path of collaborative and co-developed leading practice groundwater science guidelines to document with our science peers. For context, let's look back at the Hydrogeology of Australia by Jacobson Slough, 1987. From our understanding, there isn't anything else like it anywhere in the world that is continent spanning, and there hasn't been anything like it for 35 years in Australia. The accompanying BMR report provided is a brief summary of information about the main aquifers and groundwater systems across about 40 major Australian groundwater basins. Likewise, this has not been updated since first published and lacks input from more advanced GIS analysis. Our motivator for making our National Groundwater System Inventory is starting to collect and curate the intervening 35 years worth of knowledge and information in a nationally cohesive manner. We will start with the Rapid Inventory, which is a broad brush perspective of the state of knowledge to help us prioritise and focus our detailed inventory efforts in coming years. We're going to make this rapid information synthesis available via our data delivery portal as of the end of this calendar year. In parallel, we're also compiling more comprehensive detailed inventories of these groundwater systems to review and synthesise a state of knowledge of groundwater systems in these geological provinces. As with much of our Exploring for the Future efforts, our rapid and detailed inventory data will be made accessible via our data delivery portal, web services and database. I'll quickly move to a quick synopsis of the Rapid Groundwater Science Inventory. The Rapid Inventory provides a complete spatial coverage of our entire continent, with a focus on geological provinces at various ages, especially those for the most important groundwater resources. This Rapid Inventory also includes the intervening fractured rock provinces. Moreover, shallower aquifers over the main basins and provinces are included in our Rapid Assessment. The Rapid Inventory will start collating data and information along these broad themes including location, demographics and physical geography, and identify and point to existing scientific knowledge, particularly around the geology, the hydrogeology, the groundwater resource use and subsequent management. A quick recap of the regions under assessment include the five fractured rock domains. These are areas outside the major sedimentary basins. We have 11 Protozoic to Paleozoic basins, we have six Permian to Triassic basins, nine Jurassic to Cretaceous basins, and 10 Cenozoic basins. Now onto the detailed inventories. Within this broader rapid inventory science framework, we're looking at more detailed inventory assessments. I will start and provide a short process of this work. Building on that aggregated rapid inventory thematic table earlier, a detailed inventory will further delve into the available information. These detailed baseline inventory assessments aim to collate, review and synthesise a state of knowledge of hydrogeology in the basin, identify key data and knowledge gaps with the potential for prioritising and targeting data integration or new analyses in future. The selection of basins for detailed inventory assessments will be guided by the rapid inventory. We're also seeking external input, including outcomes and collaborative considerations from a national workshop we are hosting in the coming calendar year. By mid-2023, 
2024, GA will have completed five detailed basin inventories, including the South Nicholson region, beginning towards the end of this financial year. However, our current focus is on the Lake Eyre Basin. Some quick excerpts from, of information from the Lake Eyre Basin detailed inventory assessment includes, rivers and lakes are important as they have interactions with shallow groundwater. The project is interrogating AUSAEM airborne geophysics data to look for possible points of groundwater connection where flight lines cross major drainage lines and lakes. And I'll quickly draw your attention to the blue dots. These are the spring locations, regardless of the source aquifer. If a spring is located in significant Cenozoic age geology, then it is possible for the spring to be interacting with shallow groundwater of the Cenozoic geology, as well as discharging at the surface. Next are these green points. These are groundwater occurrences as noted in the Cenozoic cover whilst drilling a bore targeted for a deeper aquifer. Such occurrences of groundwater can be associated with perched aquifers or regional water tables. Ongoing work in the project is to attribute such aquifers from these bore intersections of groundwater. Having aggregated the rapid and detailed inventories of national groundwater systems, we will be able to integrate our hydrogeology knowledge with the wealth of geological information across the broader Geoscience Australia. But it will also allow us to seek collaboration with other agencies to ensure cohesiveness and interoperability of our national science data. A national data set that is a focus for this project is the Bureau of Meteorology's National Aqua Framework. This data set in itself is built on the 1987 Hydrogeology of Australia. A major activity of this project is to align our groundwater science inventory efforts to support the Bureau and collaboratively update the National Aqua Framework data set. These collaborative activities hope to ensure the ready interoperability of our data between our two organisations and include updating the National Aquifer Framework geological units with the latest revision of Geoscience Australia's geological data sets, updating the hydrogeological units in the National Aquifer Framework with the latest state-based aquifer terminology, and also to assess recent work by GA in mapping aquifer boundaries and develop processes to update the Bureau's aquifer boundary data set. In closing, our efforts for the National Groundwater Science Inventories will be made accessible through GA's data delivery portal as part of Exploring for the Future. We're aiming for a prototype in October this calendar year with a version one to be released soon after. We're exploring how we can interleave this groundwater information with other resource information as part of the GeoWrapper or Geoscience Groundwater and Resources of Australian Provinces Atlas. For more information on our groundwater science inventory efforts, please see the extended abstract below. We'll also be in contact for a future national workshop in the near future. Please register your interest via email. Thank you, Hashim, for providing an update on the massive task of growing a framework for groundwater understanding for Australia. Next, we will zoom in on the Tennant Creek to Mount Isa region to highlight our latest work, which aims to uncover the geology of buried frontiers. This is a joint presentation by Anthony Schofield and Chris Carson. Anthony Schofield is the activity leader for undercover geology and drilling. In this role, Anthony leads regional stratigraphic drilling programs, most recently in the Northern Territory as a part of the East Tenet project. Anthony holds a Bachelor of Science in Geology from the University of Melbourne. He is interested in bringing together multidisciplinary data sets to better understand the geology and mineral potential of Australia's covered frontiers. Dr. Chris Carson is a project geologist in the Onshore Energy Systems Directorate. He undertook undergraduate studies at the University of Tasmania, a PhD at the University of Melbourne, and postdoctoral research at the University of Sydney, Yale, and Geological Survey of Canada before joining Geoscience Australia. Well, thank you for joining us for this presentation. Today, we'll be talking about the area between Tennant Creek and Mount Isa, and what we understand about its geology and what that means for the potential for mineral and energy resources. My name's Anthony Schofield, and I'll be presenting with my colleague, Dr. Chris Carson, and we'll be walking you through some of the new insights that we've gained in this area. If you tuned into the EFTF Roadshow at the end of phase one in 2020, you remember that at the end of that first phase of Exploring for the Future, we identified two areas within the broader Tennant Creek to Mount Isa area, which showed exciting potential based on the interpretation of largely geophysical data sets. 
And in the next 15 minutes or so, Chris and I are gonna describe um, how we've continued this work during the second phase of exploring for the future. And that's led to the region becoming of even more interest to us. So just for a bit of context, the area that we're looking at is the area um, between Tennant Creek and Mount Isa. It's part of the Barclay Isa Georgetown program in the second phase of exploring for the future. And this map here just shows uh, a bit of a closer up on the area we're talking about. Like I said, it's between Tennant Creek and Mount Isa. And this was a major focus of data acquisition during the first phase of exploring for the future. Um, in general, if we have a look at the surface geology map here, we have older Proterozoic rocks in the darker colors, um, which are around the margins of this region. And then in the middle, you've got the lighter colors, which are largely younger cover sequences. But why are we interested in this area? This map helps to explain that. So this is the same map that we were looking at before with the surface geology, but this time we've plotted occurrences of a range of mineral, um, mineral types, so copper, gold, lead, zinc. Um, and what you can see is there's a very strong correlation between where those occurrences occur and where the older Proterozoic rocks are exposed near the surface. And one thing you'll note is that in the area in the middle there, the area covered by the lighter colors, there's very few known mineral resources or mineral occurrences. And that's because we have no rocks that stick out of the ground. A lot of the area looks like this. Um, these are photographs from that area. And you can see very flat, um, no, no rocks exposed. So how do we go about trying to understand what the potential is in these areas? How do we figure out where the juiciest bits of geology are that we can look at? Well, in order to zoom into an area of interest, first we need to start at the very large scale. Um, in the first phase of exploring for the future, like I said, we, we did a lot of work in this Tennant Creek to Mount Isa area. And as part of that, we acquired some very large scale um, fundamental geophysical data sets across, across the area to help us to understand the architecture and what the geology might be doing undercover. So this map here shows some of those data acquisition activities. You can see there was a lot of deep crustal seismic that was acquired and Chris will be talking about that a lot more um, in his part of the presentation but also acquiring a lot of other key fundamental underpinning data sets, such as passive seismic from Osiray, um, magnetotelluric data from the OzLamp project, and airborne electromagnetics data from the OzAEM program. So what we did was put together a lot of these large geophysical um, data sets in order to try and identify a couple of areas of interest. And those are shown here on this map. And those are the East Tenant area and the Carrara Subbasin. And we'll be delving into those a little bit more as the presentation goes on. So the first area we're going to be looking at is the East Tenant area. In this area, we applied a lot of the data sets I touched on earlier um, to recognize a prospective corridor, uh, which is buried um, undercover, east of Tenant Creek, which we call the East Tenant area, this, this region in through here. We're interested in the areas because it's a large structural corridor um, where we can recognize major faults, uh, which we can see from potential field geophysical data. Um, there's a big gradient in the lithosphere as themesphere boundary. Um, and, that also, and it also coincides with a conductive zone in log period magnetotellurics data. So we've also acquired high resolution data sets to try and map out some of these features in a bit more detail. And this image here shows how we've combined seismic data in which we can see large crust penetrating faults with magnetolurics data. And you can see how the large scale architecture um, that we can see here is controlling the electromagnetic structure. And these are the kind of important features that you would wanna have in an area if you were going to form a large hydrothermal ore deposit. So it's a very interesting area. Um, a lot of data sets are telling us it's, it's a highly prospective area, but despite its overall prospectivity, it's an area which has attracted very little um, historical mineral, mineral exploration. Um, so so if, you know, if we look in this East Tenant area through here, um, the regions had less than 10 drill holes which have penetrated into basement across an area 250, 300 kilometers across. And to put that into a little bit of perspective, that's like trying to understand the prospectivity of a region between Canberra and Sydney with less than 10 outcrops. So clearly we need to do something about that. So to gather new geological constraints and to test our interpretations of the region, Geoscience Australia, in collaboration with the Northern Territory Geological Survey, partnered with the MINEX CRC to drill 11 new stratigraphic drill holes, 10 in East Tenant, one in the Carrara Subbasin, in the region as part of the MINEX CRC's National Drilling Initiative. As part of the East Tenant and Carrara National Drilling Initiative campaigns, 
the Minex CRC obtained over 5.7 kilometers of new drill core, a really high quality drill core, really good recovery. Um, to test the geological and mineral systems ideas we had in these areas, and those holes were drilled in late 2020. Um, not only were we able to get new samples to play with, um, but through partnering with the Minex CRC, Geoscience Australia was able to access uh, researchers from CSIRO and the universities to acquire cutting edge data on these holes, which complement the work that's being done as part of exploring for the future. So these are some of the rocks that, that we intersected as part of the East Tennant National Drilling Initiative campaign. And you can see there's a range of rock types which we recovered, ranging from sedimentary rocks on the left um, through to igneous rocks, metamorphic rocks of various grades, and even intersecting rocks which showed evidence for mineral systems processes and alteration. So a lot of new uh, data points for us to play with, and a lot of new um, constraints for us to help to piece together the geological framework of the area. So following on from this drilling in the second phase of exploring for the future, Geoscience Australia and Minex CRC collaborators have acquired a huge amount of analytical data to help us to put together the geological event history of the East Tenant region. And one of the key data sets which we use to try and do that is geochronology data. Um, so particularly Geoscience Australia acquired a lot of uranium lead shrimp um, geochronology data, which you can access through the Exploring for the Future portal. And, and this image here just shows a bit of a snapshot from that where you can access that data now. And from these data sets, um, we've been able to piece together a picture of what the geological event history is for the East Ten area. And that's shown in this figure here. And it maps out the various um, major rock packages, so sedimentary events, magmatic events, uh, as well as metamorphic and deformation events. And what we can do is to put it side by side with areas where we know a bit more about the geology, where it sticks out of the ground, for example, in Tennant Creek, and start to compare the geological history of those areas. So you can see, just from a cursory glance of this, we have a very similar event history in the East Tennant area as in the mineralized Tennant Creek area. One of the key events which we want to try and understand and put into this framework is the timing of hydrothermal fluid flow and mineralization. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the rocks that we intersected as part of the East Tenant National Drilling Initiative campaign um, show evidence for uh, mineral system processes. And by looking at the textural relationships of all minerals that we recovered from that drill core, um, we can start to place when that mineralization happened in the geological history shown here. And when we do that, uh, we can see that again, the timing of mineral systems processes in the East Tenant area is very similar to what we know from, from the Tennant Creek area. So we have similar rocks, a similar event history, and now we also have a similar timing of mineral systems in the region. So the question isn't so much, why should this area have potential for major mineral systems, but why not, and where would be the best places to look? Uh, to help with this, we've delivered new maps of the basement geology undercover, which spatially represents that geological event history that we've put together. Um, so you can see uh, from this map here, the colors broadly match those in this uh, geological event history. So green matches up with green, you know, pink intrusives match up with pink intrusives on the map. Um, and what this does is it helps us to understand the spatial and temporal footprints of important ore forming geological processes. And we can then feed these kind of inputs into, into other products such as mineral potential models. So we can get a feeling for the significance of these new interpretations by comparing them with what we knew about the area prior to drilling. So if we look at the map there on the left, which is a solar geology interpretation of the area um, from, from prior to when we undertook this drilling, you can see a lot of the East Tenant area, which is shown by the box there, um, is mainly mapped as rocks belonging to the Uridigi group. Um, and this is significant because those rocks are younger than the mineralization event that you see in Tennant Creek. And so their potential to host mineralization is much less. Clearly, you can see from the map on the right that there's a much richer level of detail. So we have better mapped major structures. We have a larger volume of intrusive igneous rocks that we're able to, to map there. And importantly, we can see that rocks in the East Tennant area are the right age to host mineral systems of a similar age to those in Tennant Creek. Um, which is not the case in the map on the left. And we can feed these interpretations back into larger scale solar geology interpretations and refine those, such as those that, um, that Marie Ord spoke about. 
uh, with our building towards a national solar geology coverage. If we cast our thoughts back to where we left off at the end of the first phase of exploring for the future, what we've been able to do in the second phase of exploring for the future so far, through our drilling and the subsequent analytical program which we've used on these rocks, we've not just confirmed our ideas of the prospectivity of the area, we've actually enhanced that potential of the area by putting some geological meat onto the primarily geophysical bones that we, we started with. And this then starts to provide the, the framework that mineral explorers can use to go into the region um, to conduct their own exploration campaigns moving forward. So that's, that's the East Tenon area. Like I said at the start, there's two exciting areas that we're interested in in this region. And the second area is the Carrara Subbasin, and I'll hand over to my colleague, Chris Carson, who will tell you all about what we're doing in there. Uh, thanks, uh, Anthony. Um, uh, my name's Chris Carson. In this segment, I'll be presenting an overview of the uh, post-drilling analytical program of the deep stratigraphic drill hole, NDI Carrara 1. I'll discuss the age of sedimentation in NDI Carrara 1, regional stratigraphic correlations, implications for mineral and hydrocarbon resource potential. Before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge our collaborative partners, the MINEX CRC, uh, but in particular, the Northern Territory Geological Survey. Okay, before we get started, some background for those of you who may not have been following along. The Carrara Subbasin is a large, concealed, Proterozoic depot centre discovered during the first phase of the Exploring for the Future program by the South Nicholson Two-Dimensional Reflection Seismic Survey conducted in 2017. The subbasin is at least 8 kilometres in depth, as much as 190 kilometres from north to south, and 120 kilometres wide. And you can see it here in this figure outlined by the purple. The MINEX CRC Deep Stratigraphic Drill Hole NDI Carrara 1 was completed in December 2020 in collaboration with GA and the NTGS. NDI Carrara 1 is located on the western flank of the Carrara Subbasin and intersected some 630 metres of Cambrian uh, Georgina Basin and over 1,100 metres of Proterozoic sediments. Uh, and was drilled to test the, st the stratigraphy and better understand the geology of the Carrara Subbasin. Many of you have seen this uh, figure from previous uh, Geoscience Australia presentations. On the right is a legacy GA seismic line M2, and on the left is the eastern end of the South Nicholson line SN1. The legacy line allows us to extrapolate the high amplitude near continuous reflectors from the late Paleoproterozoic Lawn Hill formation of the McNamara Group, host to the world-class base metal uh, century deposit, into the Carrara Subbasin. Our interpretation of the stratigraphy of the Carrara Subbasin is based on the ability to extrapolate the well-studied Paleoproterozoic geology around the century mine into the Carrara Subbasin. The location of Carrara 1 uh, is shown for reference there on the far left-hand side of the figure. Based on our original seismic interpretation outlined in the previous slide, we interpreted the Carrara Subbasin contains all three Paleoproterozoic Superbasin sequences as defined by the Nabair program in the 1990s, and which remain in common usage on the Lawn Hill platform in Western Queensland today. These are the highly prospective Isa Superbasin, the older Kelvert and Leichhardt Superbasins, and are overlain by the structural remnants of Mesoproterozoic Roper Superbasin. This interpretation is summarised in the composite seismic interpretation from the Barclay seismic, which was run in 2019 and which we presented last year at ages 2021. We conclude that these superbasins can be traced concealed underneath a persistent cover of the Georgina Basin across to the Beetaloo Subbasin. The NDI Carrara 1 post-drilling analytical program, fully funded under the EFTF program, aims to establish some key reference data sets for NDI Carrara 1 for future research and resource exploration activities. We have a range of baseline data sets being collected on over 400 samples from NDI Carrara 1. You can read them for yourselves here. Uh, I won't read them out in the interests of time. These data sets and reports are available or will be as they are completed 
at the website shown here. I should also point out that uh, these do not include the independent work being done by uh, Minex CRC University partners. Today I'll be presenting uh, the highlights of two aspects of the analytical program, the shrimp uranium-lead zircon dating of tuff horizons encountered in NDI CRARA-1, and some of the key findings from the organic geochemistry studies. I should point out that we also are still acquiring, compiling and interpreting these data sets and more details will emerge at the completion of the EFTF 2 program. In this highlight slide, the key outcomes from the shrimp geochronology program from NDI CRARA-1 are shown. The data shows that much of the Proterozoic component of NDI CRARA-1 can now be confirmed to have been deposited between 1611 MA and 1588 MA. These dates are from tophaceous horizons within NDI CRARA-1 a gold standard for establishing the age of coeval sedimentation. Our results show that much of, if not all of, the Proterozoic component of NDI Carrara 1 correlates with the mid to upper Lawn Hill formation of the Lawn Hill platform in Western Queensland. We have also completed a biostratigraphic assessment of the Georgina Cambrian carbonates confirming that a middle Cambrian age of around 510 MA for that particular component of NDI Carrara 1. The take home point from the geochronology is that it allows us to make robust regional stratigraphic correlations to adjacent prospective regions. The abundant 1611 MA tufts at the base of Carrara 1 readily correlate with similar dated units in the Lawn Hill Formation, which can also contain abundant tufts dated by Rod Page at 1611 to 1616 MA, and which immediately underlie the century deposit. Similarly, immediately overlying century are tufts dated at 1595 MA which are within error of our 1588 MA volcanic ages obtained from NDI Carrara 1. Therefore, we can confidently correlate much of the Proterozoic inter intersected within NDI Carrara 1 to the mid to upper Lawn Hill formation, as I mentioned earlier, but exactly bracket the host rocks of the world-class base metal deposit at Century. These rocks are also stratigraphic equivalents of the Lawn 4 supersequence, organic rich carbonaceous shales from across the Lawn Hill platform and indicate a widespread unconventional hydrocarbon play in the Lawn supersequence. In the next few slides, I'll touch on some of the key hydrocarbon observations from NDI Carrara 1. In this figure, compiled by Emma Grosjean, we can see the downhole plots of gamma ray intensity, total organic carbon content, and hydrogen index. The hydrogen index in the, represents the amount of hydrogen relative to the amount of organic carbon present, not a measure of free available hydrogen. Uh, I refer you to the two, the, to the figures here, um, pointing out the visible hydrocarbons in NDI Carrara 1. We have the bituminous fugs uh, located in the Georgina Basin uh, at 520 metres and the two oil stains are uh, identified in the Proterozoic section at 763 metres and 765 metres in the lower part of the slide here. The Georgina Basin was found to have rocks with high total organic contents of up to 4.7%. The plot of TOC, total organic carbon, versus hydrogen index which gives an indication of the hydrocarbon generating potential of rocks, shows fair to excellent source rock potential for oil generation. The richest organic interval is located between 360 metres and 425 metres, and these rocks are characterised by high hydrogen contents as shown by high hydrogen index values greater than 300. Organic petrology analysis have shown that these organic rich rocks contain the oil prone algae derived macerals. The Proterozoic sedimentary package contains two main organic rich sections. The interval between 680 metres and 725 metres have TOC contents averaging at around 2% and maximising at 5.5%. 
These rocks have an average hydrogen index of 80, which means rocks within this section may have some potential for generating gas. The second interval of interest in the Proterozoic extends from 950 metres to 1400 metres. These rocks show good organic richness with mean TOC contents of around 1.2% uh, and up to 3.2%. However, the hydrogen com content is extremely low with a mean hydrogen index value of 2. Therefore, these rocks have no present day source potential. However, these may have potential as an unconventional resources play. In addition to the oil stains, mud gas logging recorded a sustained release of gas with up to 2% methane concentrations from around 1150 metres to 1500 metres within the Proterozoic section. Analysis of gas samples collected during drilling suggests that the gases are sourced from local, thermally mature, organic rich, rich shales and siltstones. The results of gas geochemistry has recently been released in the following report. Uh, in summary, uh, although our work has uh, many uh, outcomes that greatly add to our knowledge of this frontier region, we can summarise the key findings here. In the East Tennant region, we have identified basement rocks and an event history favourable for mineralisation as demonstrated elsewhere in the Tennant region. In the Carrara subbasin, we have confirmed the Proterozoic stratigraphy, established correlations with adjacent geological provinces that are highly prospective for base metals and hydrocarbon resources. And to wrap up, there has been a remarkable uptake in exploration licenses across this frontier region. And the figure here on the left hand side uh, shows the current coverage in petroleum and mineral tenements across the region. This is clearly a tangible and demonstrable success of EFTF program objectives. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony and Chris. It's amazing how much we now know about the geology of this buried region, which was an enigma before the Exploring for the Future. For the last talk in this session, we zoom back out and turn our attention to mapping the depths of the Australian tectonic plate with an emphasis on characterising the lithospheric mantle. Our last speaker is Dr. Marcus Haynes. Marcus is the module leader for lithospheric geophysics and economic fairways under the Exploring for the Future program. Marcus holds a Bachelor of Science with honours and a PhD in geophysics, both from the Australian National University. Marcus joined Geoscience Australia 15 years ago as a cadet and has experience in multidisciplinary geoscience with a focus on geophysical inference and mineral potential assessments. The deeper lithosphere is removed from our everyday experience of the world, but it's proving to be fertile ground for improving our understanding of Australia's resource potential. The work that I'm presenting today is on behalf of many, many people uh, and cl colleagues and, and collaborators from across the program and, and even from across the world. To summarise our efforts to characterise Australia's lithospheric mantle, I'm going to break this talk down into four main components. The first are our national scale geophysical data collection projects. Second, the application and development of novel geophysical imaging techniques. Third, the collection of ground truthing data to provide those primary constraints on the lithosphere. And finally, how we can bring all of this to bear for the inference of lithospheric characteristics and why that matters. Earlier in the showcase, Laura Gao introduced our national scale data collection projects, including those used to image the mantle. I'd like to start this presentation by focusing on the electrical methods. And here's a reminder of the OSLAMP station coverage with the exploring for the future component shown in red. An example of the utility of this approach uh, can be seen in the recent release of the Northern Australia uh, OSLAMP resistivity model published by Jingming Duan in uh, et al. in 2021. The model shows resistivity from about 10 to 200 kilometres in depth. And here we're showing a slice through 36 kilometres. What's immediately apparent is the relationship that can be seen between the major conductive structures 
and major crustal boundaries. There are many things that can raise conductivity, sulfides, graphite, water. The image shows the, the localization of these types of features and of their transport through the crust and the lithosphere. A local scale MT survey uh, conducted to the east of Tennant Creek, as shown in these insets, really highlights this. We see the broader scale conductive anomalies being throttled as they transition through the brittle ductile zone before making their way up to the surface where they, where they correlate with mapped faults. So the OSLAMP model to the left is really imaging deeper structural controls within the lithosphere, as well as potential refertilization within the mantle. By comparison with deposits, we can see that mineralization across the region is associated with these conductors. And it's not just at Mount Isa, it's also through to Tennant Creek and to the Tanami. With respect to lithospheric characterization, our other major geophysical data collection project is our passive seismic project, OSARAY. And here's a reminder of the station coverage. While we're deploying the stations uh, that are the black points, I'd like to focus in on our imaging capabilities beneath the dense pink arrays. Mary Ord Bernardo has already highlighted the importance of imaging lithospheric thickness for our understanding of sediment hosted uh, based mineral systems in Australia. Implicitly, we, we might expect to see stronger relationships between crustal features and mineralization. The profile shown here is an image developed through uh, receiver function, common conversion point modeling, and it's shining a light on the character of the moho and the uppermost mantle structure beneath those dense arrays in central Australia. This profile runs west to east, and you can see a very clear undulating moho shifting in thickness over the order of about 20 kilometers. Compared to reflection seismic profiling, it's a cheap method for mapping moho structure. And reflection seismic is restricted to roads, but where Osiré is going, we don't need roads. And let's take a look at another profile, this time running north to south. And we can see that in this case, we get a hugely disrupted moho structure. So what's going on here? This profile images several features. There's a, a prominent discontinuity at about 400 kilometers. Beneath that, there's a, a slight dip in the moho structure. And I, I guess the question is, does this terminate there or, or does it link up with these more diffuse um, structures? At 200 kilometers, we see a strong moho response that suddenly becomes quite diffuse. We can use these sorts of features to inform gravity modeling. And you can see that this profile runs through those prominent gravitational anomalies in central Australia, with two ridges of gravitational highs flanking the Aileron province. Density modeling suggests that in the north, the moho might be characterized by mafic underplating, while on the southern flank, that prominent moho discontinuity is sufficient in itself to explain the observed gravitational anomaly. If we reflect back on the uh, Northern Australia OSLAMP model, you can see the presence of a continuous conductor at these depths, coincident with the track of the Willowa Sutra on the northern flank of the Aileron province. We're beginning to, to build up a picture of mineral system, system ingredients that, that have been active within the lithosphere in these regions. And it's fantastic to see these uh, types of data sets working independently to image the crust and the mantle. But can we leverage their full imaging capabilities? We move now onto the second part of the talk to focus on how we're using new geophysical inversion techniques to maximize data potential, to bring data sets together into a common framework, and so to better characterize the lithosphere. Through the Exploring for the Future program, we've, we've previously talked about the thermochemical approach which uses geology as, as the fabric to unify multiple geophysical techniques and incorporates prior geochemical information. The approach models the major oxide composition in the mantle and uses thermodynamics to relate this to observed geophysical signals. In doing so, 
we're able to draw inferences on a huge number of lithospheric characteristics and their un associated uncertainties. We've been working with our collaborators at Macquarie University to bring together thermochemical inversions of the Australian continent. And I'm showing here some preliminary results of the mean composition within the lithospheric mantle. There are a number of features in these compositions that speak to our prior expectations. We see depletion of the heavy oxides around the, uh, the cratons, creating a chemical buoyancy to support a thick lithospheric root. We see enrichment associated with major sedimentary basins, the Canning Basin in Western Australia, the MacArthur in, in Northern Australia, even the, uh, the Clarence Morton and the Sydney uh, Gunnedah Bowen Basin systems in Eastern Australia where uh, lithospheric thinning has caused an upwelling of fresh mantle. And we see hints of uh, melt-derived depletion uh, associated with regions of more recent Cenozoic volcanism in the east. By using joint inversion, we're able to find models that, that simultaneously explain all of the available data, whether it's elevation, the geoid anomaly, surface heat flow, or Rayleigh phase velocities. And it's worth mentioning that it's really these seismic data sets that are driving these inversions, as they're the ones with specific sensitivity to the lithosphere. And we can reasonably expect that the quality of such inversions are going to improve as our understanding of the velocity structure of the Australian lithosphere improves with programs like OSRE. The result of these efforts is that for the first time, we're building towards a self-consistent, a thermodynamically consistent model of the structure and character of the Australian lithosphere, from crust down to mantle. And in the process, we'll gain so many perspectives of the properties of the Australian continent. The thermochemical approach is great, but what about magnetotellurics? I've talked about the insights that magnetotellurics can provide, and as another example, I show this deterministic inversion of OSLAMP data from southeastern Australia, sliced at about 100 kilometres. Traditional magnetotellurics has been problematic to incorporate into a probabilistic modelling framework because, and especially in 3D, it is computationally expensive. In the probabilistic approach, we need to generate a model, predict the signal through the forward calculation, compare that to data, and then update. And this process may have to be repeated millions of times. If the forward prediction is expensive, and when we're doing something millions of times, one second is expensive, then this is just not tractable. But our collaborators at Macquarie University, through the work of Costanza Manazero, have made huge advances here through the application of an elegant mathematical framework uh, that strategically uses approximations of the forward prediction to enable probabilistic 3D inversion of magnetotellurics. This allows us to pose new questions. Just, just how discrete are, are some of the conductive features that we're seeing wrapping through this model? And how much confidence do we have in the predicted values of conductivity and resistivity? The probabilistic approach creates an ensemble of possible solutions. It allows us to look at, at confidence, at uncertainties, and to test the robustness of our model inference. Importantly, it also allows us to tie into the joint inversions that I raised earlier and to exploit the sensitivities of both data sets. The introduction of teleseismic uh, tomography information in a joint inversion between magnetotellurics and seismic raises the conductivities in the southern uh, extents of the model. And this makes sense given the depths that we're peering into, into the convective asthenosphere. And again, uh, we can now infer characteristics informed by both magnetotellurics and seismology, such as the lithosphere-asthenosphere boundary. The results show a high correlation with the location of volcanoes. And this highlights how we can use such inferences to, to test models for the formation and, and evolution of, of important mineralizing events. 
Inversions are great, uh, but I'd now like to shift to the third part of the talk, to focus on the primary constraints that we get on the structure and composition of the mantle. It isn't easy to sample the lithospheric mantle directly, but our collaborators at the Australian National University, and, and particularly through the work of Zachary Suttles, have been compiling and analysing exhumed mantle rocks, that is, xenoliths and xenocrysts. Major, minor and trace element geochemistry for samples across the South Australia craton are revealing a geochemically distinct mid-lithospheric discontinuity. Furthermore, this is coupled with new pressure and temperature estimates to map out lithospheric thickness and to refine the structure of the Gawler craton, suggesting that it likely extends much further to the east beneath the Adelaide fold belt. The petrological data from xenoliths and xenocryths are providing fundamental constraints on the architecture, the lithology, the composition and the evolution of the lithospheric mantle. Zach's work helps to explain key events in the evolution of a multi-stage cratonization process for the South Australian craton, and it is currently under review. In the final part of the talk, I'd like to focus on integrating these various data sets and techniques uh, together to drive meaningful inference on lithospheric characteristics. In Collaboration with uh, Mark Hoggard from the Australian National University, amongst others, such xenolith data has been used to calibrate the conversion of, of seismic tomographic models into lithospheric temperature fields. This underpins the, the thickness of the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary uh, work that Mary Ord was discussing earlier with its implications for um, basin hosted mineralization. But it's also, it's, it's much more than that. This type of modelling is providing self-consistent models of thermal structure. These, these are providing fundamental constraints that are useful for informing and predicting the long-term evolution of, of la landscapes, of, of sedimentary basins and the distribution of natural resources. We can extract different perspectives uh, from these thermal models. And I'm showing here a map of the predicted uh, heat flow through the MOHO. And at first glance, it might seem like a relatively featureless map, but it's providing really useful constraints for understanding the thermal histories of basins and for modeling basin genesis and evolution. So it has important things to tell us about basin hosted resources. Our collaborators at Oxford University, and in particular Simon Stevenson, have compiled a global data set of crustal architecture information from passive seismic receiver function studies. You'll recall this, the uh, receiver function common conversion point profiles from Osiray that I showed earlier. Now, these are the points where we have good constraint on crustal thickness. And Simon has been using these to test hypotheses on the, the role of the crust in copper porphyry um, mineralization. Crustal thickness is, is thought to provide a control on, on copper fractionation as arc magmas pool at the base of the crust, allowing porphyry deposits that form over thicker crust to generate larger deposits. The map on the right shows an extract of copper porphyry deposits uh, that are coincident with this data set. Plotting up this data shows that in practice, no such relationship is observed, whether it's for young deposits as are shown in the black circles or for older deposits in the crosses. And while this may seem disappointing, it really highlights the importance of testing these ideas as they influence our understanding of where to look for such deposits in Australia. In a final example, I'd like to highlight the work of Alison Kirkby et al, who earlier this year published in scientific reports. Their study looked at the relationship between conductors imaged in the OSLAMP program and convergent mar margin mineral systems. They found that deposits formed early in the orogenic cycle, such as volcanic hosted massive sulphide deposits or VHMS and copper porphyry deposits show weak to moderate correlation with conductors in the upper mantle. 
For VHMS, this reaffirms the, the shallow hydrothermal uh, circulations associated with these systems. In contrast, uh, orogenic gold mineralization, a, a late stage uh, convergent margin process, it shows a very strong correlation with mid crustal conductors. This is consistent with metals being sourced from devolatization of, of mid crustal metamorphic rocks. Therefore, the imaging of electrical resistivity through OSLAMP has enabled testing of mineral system models, providing insights that provide a, a fundamental framework for, for incorporating continental scale resistivity models in mineral systems targeting. This has been an incredibly brief uh, overview of our efforts to characterize the Australian lithospheric mantle. I hope it's given you a flavor of where we're at and where we're going. Our large scale geophysical data collection projects are building national scale images of lithospheric features. The development of novel modeling techniques is enabling these data sets to be, to be understood probabilistically, to be integrated into joint models and to refine our understanding of the thermochemical nature of the lithosphere. A growing database of xenolith and xenocryst samples is providing petrophysical constraints to inform geophysical modeling, as well as giving insight into the structure and evolution of the lithosphere. Our ability to measure and infer lithospheric characteristics has already provided significant impacts in terms of our understandings of various mineral systems, and in turn, our assessments of mineral prospectivity. Thank you, Marcus, and thank you to all the speakers in the geology session. We'll now move into an open question and answer session until 3.30 with the speakers and Geoscience Australia's online subject matter experts. 